but I started as a curator of the Cowan Museum in December of 2013, and uh, later became the director um, on or about August of this past year, 2014. So I'm sort of in a stage of reforming the museum. Uh, we didn't have a mission statement, and a mission statement is so important for articulating what the museum's focus is educationally um, and what our responsibilities are to the public. So we have a, a temporary um, mission statement, and I, I just want to show you that I have our website, which is kind of exciting. We've had this for about a year. We didn't really have a website before. Um, and if you go on there, it's cowanmuseum.org. We have our mission statement on there, projects that we're doing, exhibits and events that are coming up. And I also have started um, a little uh, page with newsletters, so that explains what we're doing or what has happened at the museum. So our mission statement, this is um, sort of temporary. It needs a little bit of refining. But the Cowan Museum of History and Science collects, preserves, and interprets objects relating to regional history, its peoples, and the sciences. We strive to inspire the joy of learning about our world and how to make it a better place. So for now, that's, that's a good start. Um, but also part of reforming the museum is collections documentation. And so what I've been doing since I started was doing a wall-to-wall -wall inventory. And I believe one had been done possibly in the late 80s or early 1990s. So an inventory helps um, uh, the museum know exactly where each artifact is, what its status is, and do a sort of a an analysis of its condition, uh, that, and that, well, it also identifies weaknesses of the collection. If we have not enough that represents one area, or if we have too much duplications. Um, so that's, that's an important part of, of developing the museum, um, being responsible, um, and it, it's legally and ethically a responsible thing to do, to know exactly where your artifacts stand. Um, as of today, we have over 3,000 artifacts, and we still haven't completed the inventory in the historical park. So this time of year, I have to hope that it's a nice day in order for me to go out there. But the inventory, it, it's providing a lot of interesting opportunities to learn, and I brought some artifacts today. Uh, the old inventory, some of the artifacts are listed as tool made of iron. Um, so we have a lot of interns, volunteers doing some research. I've done a lot of research. And we found some very interesting things, and I wanted to share them with you. Just to give you a little sample of what we have. So how many of you have been to the Cabin Museum before? Yeah, a lot of you. Does this look familiar? Have you seen this before? Well, I did not know what this was, uh, and my volunteer and I, we struggled, but we persisted in doing research, and we finally figured out what it is. And it was patented in 1881, and it's a universal tool, and it's used for the kitchen. It has another purpose, too, that you'll find amusing. But it's a beautiful design. Um, it's made of, of iron. Um, we had to look for clues. It was displayed in the kitchen area. And just kind of knowing the approximate time period of some of the, the utensils there, uh, that helped us with clues. There's some very faint letters and numbers that are on this, so that provided even more information. So I couldn't believe it, but my volunteer found a picture of it. So of course we had to you know, check all different kinds of of sources. Um, but we found out that seven in one tool, and what it was, it was a trivet, yeah. and it was a pie crimper. See these little ridges here? <laughs> and it was a meat tenderizer, and for the, the old wooden stoves, you could lift the top up with that. This little <laughs> part here, and for a boiling pot, you know, the handle, you can lift it up so you don't burn your hand. <laughs> and you can pry open a can, and 
candle holders. See these little uh, holes? But this is the number one guess. When I ask people what it is, this is the number one guess that they have. And they said, well, it looks like brass knuckles. <laughs> and they're right, because it was also known as the lady's companion or household protector. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And either way. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite things. I have to show everybody that comes in. Oh, sorry. 1881. That's an early Alvin Brown device. Multi-function. Right. Anybody watches the cooking channel? Oh. Well, doesn't like a cooking utensil that's only one purpose. It's wonderful, and a lot of people say, "Well, that's like the Swiss Army knife of kitchen tools." So this was. Near it. Have, have you seen? Are you familiar yeah, yeah, with this that's, one? That's fine. Yeah, when I first started working, I thought it was just a, like a little oil can or something mm -hmm. like that. But then, with further research, we found out this is made maybe around 1900, and it's another multi-use tool. And I just love these. It was a little funnel, mm -hmm. okay. a cookie cutter, mm -hmm. and it was a biscuit cutter. And you see the, the mesh here is a sifter. It was a sieve, and it was also an apple corer. And there's, I, I need to do a little further research because there's this little spout here, and maybe it was some kind of a separator too. So not one function that I'm not quite sure what it does. But this was from around late 1800s, early 1900s. Yeah. So. Okay, now this one. You know, so I was doing inventory. I found in one of our exhibit cases uh, a collection of toys. We had some a, a roller skate key, some jacks, and then we had this. And I knew it was a noise maker. Um, I'll show this to you. There's a number <coughs> on there. And the Calvin's put a number on there. It, it gives it its own unique number, and then it corresponds to the inventory that they get. So I knew it was a noisemaker. So this is handmade. And I don't really like to handle artifacts too much, but sometimes I, I like to find out how they work. Um, and that way I can tell a better story. But be prepared for this. Okay, so you, you hold it like that. It's a ratchet, um, and so we did some further research. Um, it could have been a, a child's toy. It could be used for celebrations. But I thought it was interesting. It has um, a multicultural aspect to it. They used these in Mexico for celebrations. And in Judaism, they used them for um, a celebration of, of Purim. So I thought that was very interesting. And I'd like to include that in more of uh, the exhibit development and interpretive panels. And this one, this, I just discovered recently, so I had to share this with you. Um, it was found in a little collection of office tools, like a pencil sharpener, um, glasses, a magnifying glass. And so I just, you know, I saw this, the glass piece here, and, you know, there's a little wick. So I figured, well, it's just like a little lamp, maybe. Maybe it was used to melt wax, to seal envelopes. I just wasn't sure. So you see this number here. So I went to the inventory, and I looked, and it, it stated that it was a Cresoline lamp. And I wasn't sure what Cresoline was. So I just left it in the office section. So then I did some more research and I realized, well, it should not be in the office section. <laughs> Does anyone know what this might be? Well, I was kind of shocked. It's a medical instrument, and this is from approximately around 1888, and it burned Cresoline, and it was sort of viewed as a cure-all, it's a vaporizer, and uh, Cresoline is made from coal, coal tar. So it's poisonous and has a very pungent smell. And I found this uh, advertisement for this, and there's a child sitting very peacefully with this thing burning and filling up the room with a noxious smoke. That's what I want to be. I'll try everybody else. 
So I'd like to develop, um, we, I, we have some medical instruments. We have uh, uh, teeth pullers. We have a doctor's bag that I found. Um, so I'd like to develop an exhibit around some of those artifacts that we have <laughs> and sort of put them in the right place rather than office equipment or... Um, so that's, you know, that's part of reforming the museum, getting good documentation. And we also just got a database. It's a relational database it's called Past Perfect, which I use in other museums. Um, and let's see, I just, this might be a little difficult, but I have a picture of it. I took a snapshot because I was very proud that I put my first artifact in there. And I'll just sort of pass this around. This is the main sheet of the database, and you see these green lights here, these little green dots. Those are all records that I filled in. So you can attach the artifacts. We have over a thousand pictures that we've taken so far. You can connect it with the database. You can put the date range, um, dimensions, uh, materials, any kind of marks that you see on the artifact just to give it more of a description. And then you can key in all kinds of key words. So if you want to develop an exhibit, say, you know, on, on collapsible cups or something, you could just key in and then it'll show you everything that we have in the database. I'm really excited about this. This is going to make things a lot easier for the museum, um, just for record keeping, for future exhibit development. And it has a special area where you can note the condition of it. So through the inventory, um, I'm also discovering problems with how things have been ex uh, well stored in the past um, and, uh, and also exhibited. Um, I'll just show you some pictures and some of the remedies that we're working on. Okay, so I've been going through things, you know, old boxes, and I found a box containing this, and it looks like a mess, and the acid in the boxes, they're sort of breaking down, and there are the records, well, there's one record, and then there are a whole bunch of rolls, and they're from an organ player, so we have some, some funding, which I'll talk to you about a little bit later. Um, but these rolls were separated, and they were separated and put into acid, an acid-free box. And look how comfortable they look. They look so happy. <laughs> they're an acid-free paper roll, rolled up, and now they're safe. And so I'm trying to stop further deterioration with stable materials. Okay. Yeah, that's just another example. Okay, and I found a box of records that were on top of each other, and a couple of them on the bottom had broken, so now they're happy. They're in an acid-free box, and they're separated by acid-free materials, and they're upright instead of all the weight concentrated and breaking what's on the bottom. So I feel like making artifacts happy and preserving them for future generations. Okay, so that's, that's a little bit about the inventory. And you're probably aware of the former premise of the museum, the former uh, publicity that we might have had, marketing materials, this history you can touch. Uh, so people were able to pretty much come into the museum and just take anything down and work, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> ah, <laughs> it makes me nervous because we've had a few artifacts since I've been working that have been broken. Like we had a really nice apple peeler from the 1930s and it just kind of split. Um, we had a gravity clock that um, has, has broken, um, and I need to take that to a conservator. Um, so I realize the importance of actually touching things and seeing how things work, so I'd like to develop a separate education collection and then preserve the main collection. 
um, you know, need to rotate the exhibits and give them a rest for a little bit out of light, you know, keep them away from dust, um, don't let them move, don't let them move. Um, so that, that's kind of uh, what I'd like to do in the next um, number of years. But I'll just show you, uh, that's, that's actually another example of a razor. And it had been exhibited next to a window that was getting constant light. So it was getting heat radiation and fluctuations of temperature. So, um, yeah, it, it disintegrated. And I, you probably can't see it, but I wrote deaccession there, and that means I'm going to formally take it out of the collection because it's just worthless right now. But we're addressing problems through the inventory and, and trying to, to remedy them and, or at least prevent further uh, damage. Okay. So, let's, let's, let's. so we got this grassroots uh, funding. It's from the North Carolina Grassroots Science Program. It's state funding. So this has provided incredible opportunities for us to grow and expand on our science collection, to highlight our science collection. So what I'm excited about is the museum. If you come to the museum, it looks like a mess. It looks like it's exploded because we're getting ready for this new exhibit. But it's made possible by the grassroots science funding. We got $58,000, um, and we're using it to grow the science collection, develop outreach, um, develop exhibits, and do you remember the parlor? The parlor in the museum with the big piano, and it was in the front room. And this is the picture of the way it, it looked before. It's a beautiful room, but it had been there for, you know, maybe what, 34 years, the same. So with the grassroots science funding, we're working on a new geology exhibit. And so you can kind of see the transformation. We still have a little more to go. We only have about a week left. And I think we'll get it done. We're encountering some problems, but I think we'll get it done. So the funding has provided the opportunity for us to have six interns from the Duplin County, or the Duplin Early College High School, and one from the James Keenan High School. They've been researching our geological specimens, and many of them haven't been identified. So they've spent their internship researching igneous rock, metamorphic sedimentary um, minerals and fossils, and I, I'm giving you a sneak preview of the exhibit that we're going to have next week. And then also, uh, we have um, interactive. You can make a fossil impression with plaster, so that's more of a hands-on experience that people can take away with them and remember. So, let's see. I didn't bring enough of these, but this is for the exhibit. It's called Old Rocks, Young Minds. And I'll just pass out a couple. They're invitations. We're going to have an exhibit opening reception next Friday, and we'll have three snacks. And we'll have the James Keenan High School band members play some music. And then you'll see this beautiful this beautiful exhibit that the students have worked so hard on. So I'd like to give you a sneak preview. And it's forming these relationships. Oh, we need some over there. I don't know. It's forming these relationships, like with the high school. Um, the teacher is helping the students, and we have some specimens that are on loan. And <coughs> I was going to ask her, you know, can, we, can we take your artifacts? to the talk I'm giving, and she said, well, you can have them. So there are going to be new donations. And so these contacts that we're having with, with um, you know, other organizations, uh, educational institutions, it's, it's helping our collection grow, and it's enhancing it. So one of the students, or two of the students, are working on igneous rock. And that's you know, the molten magma. Uh, so this is obsidian, and one of our volunteers just donated this uh, about a year ago. He donated three pieces of obsidian from Idaho, 
and it's, it's volcanic glass. You can see how beautiful it is, how smooth. He gave us three pieces in different states. This is, had been smooth, so it looks so shiny and glossy. And, and out west, um, if they polish them, they were known as patch tears. Or the warriors fell in battle. Obsidian is their folklore. Oh, the moon that they called it the patch of tears. Well, well, thanks for mentioning that. That's interesting. So this this was on loan, and I just found out yesterday it's going to be a new piece for the museum, and it's called a volcanic bomb. And what this what is interesting about this is as a volcano erupts, some pieces of lava they cool so quickly that they sort of form like a bomb. It can do a lot of damage. But if you see these bridges on here, that's from when it was flying through the air and it cooled. So I'm going to get back here. I'm going to show you something so we can get a good view of that. This is one of my favorite pieces and I'm thrilled that it's going to be part of the museum collection. So this wasn't one of the donor's best examples. She has one that's shaped like a football, so that really makes an impact of it flying through the air. It's shaped like a football. So her students would really you know, love something like that. Well, it looked like a turtle to me. A turtle? Huh? It does. It does, yeah. So this is going to be a new museum artifact, too. And it's sedimentary rock, and it's called a concretion. And a concretion, it starts with a nucleus, like a piece of sand or something. Um, and then the sediment will collect around it, bury it, and continually to harden. And what's interesting about this is the nucleus, in this case, was a little worm-like creature. And somehow it just separated, but you can see some of the twin images. So uh, this is some kind of marine creature. Um, often the sedimentary rocks formed in water, like in lakes and rivers, in oceans. Um, so this is going to be a new artifact. For, well, not artifact, but a specimen for the museum. And we're also doing fossils. And this belongs to the museum. It's a megalodon tooth. And it's from an extinct species of shark. This was found in Cove City, North Carolina, and it was carbon dated to about a million point five years. Yeah. So this this will be on exhibit. We have coral, fossilized coral that will be on exhibit. And these these belong to the museum. And I was able to figure out what this one was. Isn't it beautiful? It's, it's smoky quartz that's inside. But the students picked out this one, and I wasn't sure what it was. And I figured out it was some kind of quartz, but I didn't know. So we, we asked their teacher what she thought it was, and she just was amazed because she had never seen anything this dark. This is another example of smoky quartz. But she was, she was amazed how, how dark that she hadn't seen anything like that. And there are some unique pieces in the collection that she was reviewing, studying, and, and she said they're quite unique. Um, so that's another reason to come to the museum and, and look what we have. And one of the last things I have, and I have to show this to everybody, I'm going to pass it around because you can all play with it. Whereas this, I, I always tell people that they should take this to the United Nations because it brings people together. doesn't matter how old you are, what your background is. I've had people come from different countries. I've had people from African countries, from European countries, Mexico. They all, you know, they, they kind of you know, say, well, what's so great about that? And then they show them, and, and there's a, oh, and their eyes light up, and I love that, because it just brings people together. So it's a mineral. Uh, the students were thinking of having this in the exhibit, but... Uh, we decided against it because when we have tours, we just have to show everybody this, so it can't be in the exhibit case. Um, Donna Cowan, um, she, she's the one who taught me about this, the former curator. <coughs> she taped it up because it fractures the 
but it's a mineral. It's called olexite with a U, and it's composed of all these hollow straw-like fibers. And if you look at at this under a microscope, it looks like straws. So if you cut perpendicular on each side and then you polish it, it acts as fiber optics. And some of you won't be able to see it from where you are back there, but I'll pass it around. Okay. So focus on the letters I have here. So I'm going to put this up there. And it's the way the light is conducting down the rods. It shows through. And the, the science funding uh, will help me build more of a collection. There's another kind of mineral, and the name is escaping me right now, but it's, it's similar. You place it on a text or a picture, of it, and it shows double vision. Oh, it is. Yeah, I'll, I'll work with that. But I'll sort of start on this table, and you can pass it around, and you can play with it. So the science uh, aspect of the museum is going to allow us to do outreach programs, too. And there's one I'm very excited about that I'm still developing, but it comes with a textbook, and I have to read it and study it. <laughs> and I'm working with the Duplin County STEM uh, d district STEM coordinator and the K through eight curriculum director, um, <coughs> and I'll show you what I bought. Okay. And one of my volunteers finally put it together, and she's trying to figure it out. But this is going to be a traveling trunk program, and I'll go through Duplin County Schools with this, and it's about renewable energy. So you see all the, the parts there. There's a little solar panel there, and you leave it in the sun, and they're all interchangeable parts. And it will get the fans going. There's a fuel cell battery in there. So this won't only be at the school, so if you're interested in playing with this and learning about renewable energy, we have some of these solar farms here now. And feel free to come find a museum and it's an experiment with this. So do you have any questions? Oh, oh, I forgot to tell you. Not only do we have the geology exhibit that's opening up next next week, but after that we're going to have a nanotechnology exhibit that opens on May 7th. And that's going to involve a lot of interactives. It's going to be in two, two rooms. That's the downstairs area of the museum. And then after that I'm developing an exhibit called the Science of Sound. And some of you may be familiar with the phonographs that we have, the, the cylinder records, the 1920s radios. So I'd like to incorporate that with the science of sound and have some interactives. And instead of actually playing the cylinders, I'd like to have um, the music digitized so you can listen to it. So I'm just very excited about everything that's going on in the museum. So has everyone had a chance to play with the Alex Light? That's fascinating. So do you have any questions for me? Or do you have questions about where the museum is going? Or hours? You probably know our hours. It's a wonderful opportunity for the community to celebrate. Thank you, Bobby. Excellent job. Let's give her a big